Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Erdman. Um, I work over at SickKids and I'm a PhD student at U of T in computer science. Um, I work with genomic data, um, but more a bit historically, and now I'm moving over more into clinical data and um, even imaging uh, data. And um, I work with Dr. Anna Goldenberg. And yeah, we've been teaching this, uh, this portion for, or this uh, module for the last few years. So I'm here to carry the torch for my supervisor today. Um, and uh, oh yes, and something off my CD. Uh, so, uh, so I keep fish. So I have freshwater tanks and saltwater tanks. I have coral and crabs and uh, have fish. Uh, so if any of you guys are into that, I would love to show you pictures always um, <laughs> and talk about them. So just let me know. Um, great. And I'm hoping to get to know you guys more as we work together, especially during the lab. All right, so um, as we all know, I'm sure you've seen this about 12 times at this point, uh, we've got the Creative Commons license, so you can use these slides. Um, please share them widely. Um, only the correct stuff, of course. Um, and then uh, today we're going to talk about data integration, or this afternoon. Um, and specifically, uh, we're going to talk about kind of all the different kinds of clinical and genomic data actually that should be included in there. Um, and we're gonna talk about single data type analyses. Um, and we're gonna look at a lot of this from the perspective of like clustering or trying to find patterns in a large amount of the data among your patients. Um, and then we're gonna look at data integration methods. Uh, and those methods are again, like primarily clustering methods. Um, so concatenating cluster, I cluster, and similarity network fusion, which was developed in my supervisor's lab. Um, and then we're going to talk about advantages and drawbacks of different methods. And then last, we're going to talk about survival analysis uh, briefly. And then in the lab, we're going to do similarity network fusion and survival analysis, both in R. Um, so, uh, as you are certainly aware, especially across this week, um, there is so much available patient data and much of it is relevant to cancer or, or many different patient phenotypes. So this includes genetic, epigenetic, genomic uh, data, proteomic data, questionnaires to understand the phenotype of your patient, clinical data, maybe from EHRs or maybe systematically collected through a study, um, imaging data to identify the cancers, uh, and of course, things like diet or, or different lifestyle um, uh, factors so when you want to pull these together it's really challenging because they're not they don't all map to the same unit so uh, for genetic or gene expression uh, data you can and even epigenetic you can usually map it to a gene but not always um, and then microRNA you can't map it to a specific gene or maybe you want to map it to the genes they target um, proteins of course and that's just a subset of the genes or the protein coding genes um, and then clinical, you can't map to an individual gene, so you want to integrate them somehow. Um, so we're going to talk about how people have done this um, in some cases, and by no means is this exhaustive. Um, and so some reasons you would want to integrate this data. Um, so you, maybe you want to identify a more homogenous subset of patients that maybe they respond to a similar drug. Uh, maybe they have a similar prognosis. So maybe some of them will go on to require surgery and some of them will resolve without, for example. Um, and maybe some will uh, require different clinical management. So uh, we've worked with uh, patients who have cancer predisposition syndromes, and we're trying to segment them into a population that needs uh, more regular scans, more, more regular full body MRIs, because they're at higher risk of getting cancer sooner, and another group that maybe they don't need to come in for scans as often. So kind of stratifying your patients into risk groups. Um, this can be really helpful for that. Um, and also integrating your data allows you to get um, a fuller picture of the patient. So you're not just looking at um, maybe their gene expression, you're also looking at their lifestyle or environmental exposures or uh, their clinical history. And all of that is actually really important for the person that you're seeing in that moment. Um, so uh, an example of a single data type analysis for the purposes of this talk would be um, this GBM study um, by Ling et al. in 2005 in PNAS. And so they collected gene expression data and they uh, selected the most variable genes, so the differentially uh, expressed genes, and uh, they performed a hierarchical clustering on them. And uh, how many of you are familiar with hierarchical clustering? 
Okay, cool. So we're going to go into it more in depth, um, but this is just to say it's one way of uh, dividing the patients in this data set based on um, who has more similar uh, gene expression here. And so they identified two clusters and they identified genes that are really dividing these uh, groups of patients into two clusters. And they then looked at the survival patterns of these patients and they found that in these two groups, they actually have a really different survival pattern. Um, so also, how many of you are familiar with survival Kaplan-Meier curves? Awesome, great, so a lot, that's perfect. So I'm just gonna go over it briefly, um, and this will actually make the survival analysis part go uh, pretty fast. So they found in one group, uh, actually, yeah, I should ask, uh, which group has a more kind of severe prognosis here, would you say? Which group is worse off? Yes, exactly. So group two, they're dying faster. So if we look at survival at one year, we can see in group one, 80% of that group is surviving for one year. Um, but in group two, only 20% survive. So m the majority of that group is actually dying within the first year. So they were able to find a gene expression pattern that really differentiated the, the prognosis and um, development of cancer in, or um, uh, the prognosis of cancer in these patients. Um, and then here we show the censored observations. So one really nice quality of survival analysis is that you can include information from incomplete observations. So you can show that um, if you don't know when an event happened for someone, you can still include their information in your data set because you know that no event happened up to a certain point. But we'll discuss that more. Um, so there's ways to incorporate information from other data types in a single data type driven integration. So um, before I talked about how Lang et al., uh, they chose the most variable genes to include in their hierarchical clustering. Um, and so this other group, um, Verhoek et al., uh, they did something very similar uh, in GBMs, but instead of only including the most differentially expressed genes, they also included, um, or the most variably expressed genes, they also included genes that had mutations in them or specific mutations that they thought were especially deleterious. And then they also looked at the copy number variation in the genes um, and included the expression of those genes. So here it is all gene expression being integrated and then clustered, but they're choosing more to incorporate based on um, information from other data types. So it's a, it's a flavor of data integration where you don't directly include the other data types, um, but you're selecting from a single data type using information from other data types. Um, and they were able to find uh, different groups. It's not very um, outstanding, like it doesn't uh, show up very well there, but they were able to find uh, a bit of separation between these groups. However, uh, it led to the identification of the proneural, neural, classical, and mesenchymal groups within GBMs. Um, so this approach is, is valid and actually can uncover some important signals um, in the data. Um, but here, again, it's like, what about methylation data? There's so many other data types you may want to incorporate and information you may want to incorporate. And it seems difficult for how you would actually choose to include the methylation data because um, mutations in cancer, uh, there are kind of the classical genes where um, if you know that these are cancer driver genes and if you have a mutation in that, uh, it would be an important gene to include in your analysis. And same with copy number variation. If you see huge spikes in copy number variation, you can assume that something's really uh, crazy there, something's going wrong. But with methylation, um, we know the whole genome is kind of uh, changing in terms of its methylation signal uh, in most cancers, um, and particularly um, certain types of cancers actually. So uh, how would you incorporate that information? It becomes a bit more challenging. Um, when you move into the epigenetics. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some different integration approaches. And as I said, it's not exhaustive, but um, I'm going to go over uh, some approaches of concatenating and clustering. So this is trying to use all of those data types, um, but combine them into the analysis and not just use prior information and, and have one data type that you're clustering. So concatenate and cluster, I cluster, and then similarity network fusion. So concatenate and cluster is pretty straightforward. Um, as it suggests, there's a first step. So here I'm showing we have methylation data and gene expression data, and we literally just concatenate them together. So we put them together, and now um, for features for a patient, we have all of their gene expression and all of their methylation 
uh, levels uh, per probe, or we could con uh, we could combine those across genes. Um, if we keep it at the probe level, can anyone tell me some issues that might arise uh, if you just concatenate all of your gene expression data and all your methylation data and then cluster your patients? Um, Yeah, yep, yeah, you'll be double counting, which could be good or bad because if you have that double signal, you may want to boost that. So, um, but it just it depends what you're hoping to find. But uh, certainly. Yeah. So. Totally. Yeah. So the question was. Um, what are some problems that may arise when you're just concatenating and then clustering? Um, and so uh, Roman brought up that you're going to be double counting your genes. And then um, Garrett uh, kind of emphasized that point by saying that when you're double counting, you're actually not even double counting equally because some genes are going to have multiple probes within them. And some genes may have no probes actually that are nearby or in their promoter. And then the other issue is methylation has around, depending on your array, 450 to 850 probes in general, um, if you're using uh, the 450K or 850K uh, arrays. And so that's compared to gene expression where you're sitting around 2,000 genes and likely less after quality control. Um, so your signal might be totally swamped as well by that uh, 400,000 uh, measurements uh, versus the 20,000 so you might not act, you might have no gene expression signal that you're pulling out um, because it's all taken up by your methylation signal um, so that can be an issue when you do this concatenation um, and so the idea of concatenate and cluster is you concatenate and then you cluster and so I'm just going to briefly go over hierarchical clustering um, so this is a distance matrix and um, it's a um, symmetric matrix so that means that this lower triangle here in green is the same as the upper triangle here in purple and so if you look at uh, this for example this uh, red uh, cell here 0.5 it's also up here so this is showing how different D and F are um, and so they should be equally dissimilar uh, in every view like uh, it's it wouldn't change there so um, the reason it's highlighted is because that's the lowest. So if we're looking for the, the minimum distance uh, single linkage, then we would say, okay, the closest two are D and F, um, and it looks like the second closest are um, E and D maybe. So uh, if, as you're building your hierarchical clusters, it's basically ordering um, the linkage. Um, across them. So here you've got D and F are the first ones and then like as you move it out, like as you allow for more um, to be clustered within the same group, then you're going to have E joining in there and then C is the next one um, that's growing closer but it's quite distinct so it's a bit further off when it's um, added in and then A and B are actually much closer to each other than any of these so they're going to be added in as well earlier on um, and then at some point like as you increase the threshold you're going to have them all grouped together and so that threshold is shown here so as you can see at 0.5 uh, dissimilarity, you would have D and F come together, um, and then at 1, E comes in and joins those two, um, and at about 1.5, you've got A and B coming together. So that's what that represents. And so when you're trying to decide the number of clusters, though, like hierarchical clustering builds that whole tree or dendrogram. Um, and so there's a few ways you can do it. Um, cutting the dendrogram by eye, honestly, it's it's... If you have clear clusters, which I would say here you have the A and B group and then you have the DFEC group, it's it's respectable. Like it's fine to do if you have clear uh, groups that are falling out, especially if, if it's very obvious based on your dendrogram. Um, but usually if it's very obvious, it will also be supported by different statistics. So one of the statistics that you can use to decide the number of clusters is the silhouette statistic that I'll uh, talk a bit more about. Um, you can also, if you're doing spectral clustering, which means you're taking uh, the principal components of your data and then you do um, clustering on those, uh, or you build a distance matrix off the first few PCs, 
Um, then eigengaps uh, developed by Tipsharani is a, a great way to choose the number of clusters. Um, and there's many more that are reviewed in uh, Jan et al.'s uh, 2005 PhD thesis. He reviews different, um, different ways to choose the number of clusters based on what your clustering method is. Um, but there's also other um, uh, papers written on this. So the silhouette statistic, um, I really like it. First of all, oh yeah, I didn't, I edited my own slides, but not these. So first of all, uh, I found this confusing when I was reading it um, at one point. So pattern here, pattern means um, observation. So you can think of it as an observation. So it shows graphically how each observation or pattern is classified into a cluster. So for each pattern or observation in a given class, it's saying how close are you to everyone else in your same class mm -hmm versus the average distance to all other classes, like all other um, patterns in all other classes. And so if you're more similar to everyone within your own cluster, then you're gonna have a silhouette statistic that's above one, but if it's, or above zero, sorry. If it's below zero um, and uh, up to negative one, uh, then it's showing that you're actually closer to individuals or observations that are outside your own cluster. So for example, this negative group here um, they could equivalently just be put in another cluster and do as well. So it seems like maybe you've cut too many. Um, you really want to minimize uh, or, or maximize this statistic um, because this is showing, for example, that you've got some negative uh, samples here and these could very easily be put in a different group. Um, so in silhouette plots, they're usually shown like this, where you have one cluster, two cluster, three cluster. So it'll it'll divide your um, your observations by cluster, and then it'll show you how those clusters. It'll order them so you can see where they drop off. Like, do you have half your cluster where they could just belong with anyone else? Um, and that's really good to see um, if that is the case, because you may be uh, just kind of drawing a line in your data where there doesn't really uh, there doesn't seem to be one that exists. <coughs> What is the distance? So what is the, what defines distance? Ah, yeah. So distance can be a lot of things. So you could have a Euclidean distance, for example, which is just a squared um, difference between two points. Um, you could have, uh, there's all kinds, um, Hamming distance, um, where I think Hamming is just a zero, one kind of count between two. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I think distance is more of a function of what your data type is. Um, so if you have binary data, right, you want data, you want your distance to just be one if they're the same, zero if they're not the same, right? Um, a Euclidean distance wouldn't make as much sense there, um, though it would be similar. Um, but if you have continuous data, you may want a Euclidean distance. There's also um, really cool distances you can use. So you can use Euclidean distance, for example, if you have trajectory data, um, but you can also use things like Frisch distance. So what Frisch distance shows is um, if you're, the analogy everyone uses is if you're walking a dog and your dog's on one course, so that's one of the trajectories, and you're on another course, so that's your trajectory, what's the maximum leash length that you need for that dog? So it's it's saying what's the largest difference between the two clusters, and then it defines the distance as that largest distance between any two clusters, or two trajectories, pardon. For instance, for a gene expression data set, yep. Um, in gene expression, I would say the distance should probably be Euclidean, especially if it's log normalized, because then you have continuous normal data. So um, you're just wanting to find the distance between two genes uh, that are on the continuous scale. So you're just going to find the squared distance between them. Sure. So if you're clustering genes, then you would do it for their expression levels across patients. Or if you're clustering patients, you would do it a uh, square distance across uh, all of their gene expression between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, to the distance yeah. you're talking about, doesn't matter, for example, if you have sets of options for the distance, you could choose, for example, the Kopsky distance yeah. over, let's say, Distance. Yep. It can. It can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
It can. Yeah. And so then you'd want to really think of what does my distance represent and is it representing what I want to be representing in my data? So um, because it's like if you just find clusters through that, then that can be a good or a bad thing. It could be an artifact of the fact that like you use a distance that's not necessarily appropriate. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it, it's really where you'd want to go into like the theoretical aspect of the distance and um, what you're actually measuring. Like are you assuming um, like, are you assuming certain aspects of your data that are not right to assume? Um, like, its properties about its distribution, for example. Good question to you guys, though. That's super important, and choosing the right distance metric is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, oops. I thought I got rid of this slide. So this is just to say, uh, you can see that the silhouette uh, the silhouette scores in these two, for example, or in these three, they're going to be very low, whereas the silhouette scores in this are going to be likely uh, well above zero. Um, so that's what silhouette's representing. Like, if you're having clusters where you're just dividing what seems like one cluster, like maybe the, the optimum here actually should be three clusters. All right, so iCluster is another method um, that's been developed and uh, used quite a bit, actually. And it's a Gaussian latent variable model. And so basically they're saying um, you have multiple Gaussians uh, in your data, and, and those are your clusters. So your clusters are um, a mixture of Gaussians. Um, and it's saying, I want to take, I want to find those clusters within each of the data types um, and so it treats them as latent variables that are all feeding into the same um, clusters and uh, it regularizes it so one really attractive aspect of this is this sparsity regularization means that most of the data is going or much of the data is going to actually not contribute at all to your clusters so when you make your clusters it's going to tell you what is important um, for making those clusters so the ones the specific genes for example where you see that the copy number for that gene is not, the coefficient on it is not set to zero. That means that that is important for the clusters that you discover. Um, so having the sparsity regularization, it means that um, you're going to be able to go back through and say this and this and this are important for the clusters that I discover here. Um, and so some drawbacks of uh, iCluster are that because it's so computationally intensive, you have to select a subset of genes, um, methylation probes, microRNA, etc. Um, so it can't use a large, large amount of data unless you have incredibly high compute power or um, are able to uh, work with it actually a bit more closer to the machine. Um, and so there's a lot of manual processing because you want to pre-filter your genes. It takes about 1500 genes max, uh, so you can't just throw in all of your gene expression, for example. Um, and there's many steps in the pipeline, so um, you're making a lot of choices along the way. And uh, depending on why you make those choices, you might want to test the stability of your model. Um, so, uh, for example, as Omid asked that question about um, choosing your distance metric, uh, if you choose some hyperparameter about doing the eye cluster, you might want to be like, how sensitive is my analysis to this choice? And so that means now you're doing multiple parallel analyses to see like, okay, if I tweak this by this much, like if I change this 0.5 to 0.8, like does it change everything for me? If I change this threshold um, to some number, does it change everything in our findings? And you would want to know if, how sensitive your results are to that, so it can be a drawback. Um, and the integration is mostly done in the feature space. Um, so if there's a signal that's a combination of the features, it's not going to find it. So usually it's finding um, it's finding clusters that are driven by single groups of the features. So the copy number variation or the gene expression. Um, and so if there's a gene expression copy number variation, uh, for example, actually, or the methylation gene expression signal um, that Roman brought up, um, if, if that exists in your data, this is not going to necessarily capture that unless that's strong enough in the individual data types. It won't leverage patterns that are existing across the different data types. Um, yeah. So similarity network fusion. Uh, Bo Wang, who actually, uh, he's the head of the AI research group at Princess Margaret um, now. Um, 
so he developed this method in Gon uh, Anna Goldenberg's lab, and uh, his idea was to integrate data in the patient space. So before when I was saying like it's pretty tricky if you have, for example, gene expression, uh, and you have genetic data, and you have microRNA, and you have say nutrition data, they don't all map to a unit like a gene, but they do map to a unit like a patient. So what you can do is put all of them in a patient space, which I'll describe more uh, in detail, and then you can fuse them together in that patient space. Um, so uh, just to go into it more concretely, so putting them in the patient space essentially means creating a distance or similarity matri uh, matrix or a network. So these matrix, these matrices are, are actually just networks um, where uh, you have an individual patient and then their connection to the other patients are the cells here. So uh, if you think of this uh, row and column as patient one, you can see they're not really connected with anyone. And so that's why they would show up on the network as not having connections, right? So a matrix, a distance or similarity matrix can be represented as a network. Um, and that's why this is called similarity network fusion, even though you'll see a lot of matrices here. What? Uh, it means that they're very dissimilar from everyone. So they're kind of off on their own. Whereas patient eight here is very connected um, to several people here. So that means that they're very similar to them. Uh, whatever data was put in. So here it would be gene expression. So it'd be like their gene expression profile is really similar to this group of people. Um, but this person has a really different gene expression profile. Um, yeah, and so then with these networks, um, so with your data types in the patient space, uh, then you do a fusion where you're basically doing graph diffusion. So you're multiplying them by a sparse version of themselves, which means uh, we knock out all of these small uh, connections here and say only keep the really high ones and then multiply this one by this one. And we do it vice versa for this one to this one and then do that in an iterative fashion. And what that ends up doing is um, it grows any pattern that is either strong in a single data type or is shared by multiple data types. So if it's a medium signal, like and when I say signal, if I, I mean medium connection, uh, so a connection like, let's say, like this one, where it's kind of moderate on this and this data type, but it will be retained uh, when you're multiplying it through, and it will be upweighted because it's shared across the two data types. Um, but connections like this one, that's it's pretty weak in this data type. Sorry about that. Uh, it's pretty weak in this data type, and it's not shown in this data type. Those are going to be uh, pushed down, and so it's a kind of a way of um, denoising uh, your your clusters between your patients using multiple different data types. Um, and then you get a fused matrix, so you get a single matrix out um, or a single network uh, that represents clusters that are, uh, they have a signal from both of your data types in there. Um, so this was done in the, in the Nature Methods paper uh, that Bo wrote with Dr. Goldenberg uh, in glioblastoma. Um, and they, they integrated data from methylation, um, mRNA, and microRNA. Sorry, these rotated back when I sent it. Um, and uh, the fuse matrix, you can see that denoising that I described. So you can see how you get a much stronger uh, signal in your clusters, and you have a much darker, so like much lower connections outside your clusters. So you're basically finding what signal is shared across these data types and really upweighting that uh, within your data. And so this and this are the same thing, just represented one as a network and one as a matrix. Um, and what you can do is you can see um, what are the data types that are actually driving the connections. Uh, so for example, uh, we've got this, um, little cluster here that is like very driven by the combination of methylation and microRNA signal. So this group is similar and the similarity is, is primarily driven by those two data types whereas the gene expression data is actually not uh, contributing a lot to that signal whereas in this uh, cluster you've got this portion of the cluster that is much more driven by the gene expression data. Um, and so 
when they looked at the clinical properties of these subtypes, they were able to find that there is uh, a real distinction in uh, their their prognosis um, and also uh, their clinical or, or sorry their uh, patient attributes. So uh, subtype three, which I believe is this one, is um, it's a younger group and it seems to survive longer. Um, and I believe it was the IDH1 subtype that they actually, um, which is who these people are. Um, and they respond better. Uh, or treated, I'm not sure what this actually means, treated versus untreated. So, um, yeah, so some advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's an integrative feature selection, so you don't have to choose upstream um, what data you're integrating necessarily. It can be helpful just for interpretation. Um, so we did it using um, neuroimaging, and we found that uh, we're, you know, you're always able to find clusters in patients based on neuroimaging data, especially structural MRI. Um, but what those clusters mean, um, like if you're trying to find clusters that correspond to, in this case it was OCD um, subtypes, uh, we were just swamping our signal with just other aspects of them. So we got a huge like gender and age signal when we were clustering them. And so we found that if we were more specific about which regions we included in our analysis, um, so that we included regions that were um, known to be associated with uh, OCD symptomatology, then we were better able to actually find clusters that were meaningful. So you don't have to choose cluster or you don't have to choose your features upstream but it can be very useful if you um if you maybe like with cancer for example you've got a big genome-wide signal but with um some phenotypes or even some cancers you may not have that huge signal across every gene so maybe choosing genes can be useful um in that case um growing the network uh requires extra work so uh it's it's uh very computationally intensive if you have thousands of patients. So uh, that can be a drawback. Um, and then it's unsupervised. So um, just from experience of trying to publish uh, similar network uh, analyses, um, everybody wants to make conclusions after the fact. And it's really kind of showing you what's in your data. Like, like unsupervised analyses are, are just giving you back your data in a different form, basically, um, which supervised analyses are too in some respects, but, but really unsupervised analyses are, right? So um, it's, it's hard to turn it into a supervised problem uh, other than just doing this kind of thing where you say, um, can I separate groups here? Like, um, but even then, it's that's more observational. You're not you're not really predicting anything, so um, that can be a constraint. So it's really good for exploring your data, understanding your data, seeing if there's a great pattern that persists across different data types. Um, but if you're looking for a supervised analysis, I would not choose an unsupervised method to do that. Basically, um, yeah. Sorry, uh, can you ask? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, uh, is semi-supervised learning relevant for genetics data? And I certainly think it is. Um, one huge benefit of semi-supervised learning is that um, you can use more data. Um, so maybe you don't have labels for some portion of your data. Um, then you can use your unlabeled data. Uh, you in addition to your labeled data to do your analysis. So I definitely think it is. Um, I have a colleague who uh, did an analysis called, um, well, he, he wrote a paper called Dr. VAE, um, and he developed a variational autoencoder, which is, uh, he used a semi-supervised approach to basically in create an embedding for patients um, in the gene expression uh, space to predict how they would respond to different drugs. Um, and he was able to use labeled and unlabeled drug response data, uh, gene expression drug response data for that. And so I certainly, I certainly think there's a role for it. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, I think he, he did a pre-selection where he chose the most variable genes. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I can't actually remember specifically how Ladislav solved that problem. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so switching over to survival data, uh, a really different data type, but um, as you've seen, uh, we apply our uh, similarity network fusion clusters to 
um, trying to understand patient survival um, often. So understanding survival analysis is really useful for that. Um, so survival data, it's it's called time to a single event data or time to event data, and the analyses are called time to event in general, um, and not survival. So something that I just uh, want to point out about, or actually I guess here we can talk about it is, um, so it's a time to event. So you have uh, you have a start point, like a beginning of a study or the beginning of a person's life. Um, so like age until, or time, years lived until you get cancer, years lived until you die, for example. Um, and then you have uh, days to last follow-up, for example, if you have censored observations. So you have the end of the study and not everybody is going to be um, having a completed event at that point. So not everyone, for example, will die um, before your study ends, generally speaking. Um, and so one really important assumption about survival data, and, and this is in part why it's called survival data and not time to event, is that at some point the event will happen. So we know that even though we never observe that these people have died, they are going to eventually die. Um, and so this becomes an issue if you want to do time to surgery, for example, um, or time to transplant, or some time to event analysis like that. Um, because not everyone, if you censor them, it's or if they don't get surgery, yeah, if they don't get surgery within the time of your study, it doesn't mean they will at some point in their life get that surgery, or they will at some point uh, get a transplant. Um, and so that's why uh, it's called survival data, because we can reliably say that everyone we see is going to die at some point. Um, and so if you want to use a time to event, these are also failure models, um, accelerated failure um, models uh, will model survival data. Um, they were for actually modeling, I, I think this is the case, uh, developed for modeling uh, light bulb uh, time to failure or device time to failure. And again, you know at some point that is going to fail. So you can, it fits those assumptions. So if you want to transfer it to some other time to event um, uh, situation, you just have to make sure that that one uh, assumption, <laughs> among others that we'll talk about, um, is really satisfied because that is a, a very important assumption you're making when you're, you're doing these models. Um, but what's cool about it is it allows you to use these observations where if you were just, mo oops, sorry, if you were just modeling this as um, like at what point do they die and I need to know the end point, then these people would have to be left out of your analysis. And what survival modeling does, uh, it allows you to include these people and just say, I only have up information up to this point. I know they didn't die up to that point. So they will, they have survived at least this long. So you can include their attributes and their observations and, and increase the power of your study um, by including those um, uh, people without observed final events. So there's two important statistics um, within survival modeling. Uh, there's your survival function. So it's the probability of someone being alive at time t. So the probability that they're alive uh, at t. So they're good up to that point. And the hazard rate. So the, prob the hazard rate is the probability of a person dying in the next instant. So it's kind of like a derivative, right? Like it's, it's a, a limit. Uh, it's a limiting statistic, and it says, uh, what's the probability that you'll die just immediately in the next moment? Um, and so some examples of a hazard rate are a constant hazard rate that at any given time, I mean, it says no aging here. Um, you could think of it that way, or it's just like at any given time, you have just a completely constant likelihood of um, dying. It just does not change with time. Um, a positive hazard rate, so the older you are, the more likely you are to die. That is, in general, the hazard rate that we encounter. Or a negative hazard rate, um, and so when you have high infant mortality, for example, uh, that would be represented with a negative hazard rate early in life. So as you live longer, you are going to tend to live longer. All right, so um, everything we've looked at in terms of like, survival graphs, they've been KM curves, Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, and the Kaplan-Meier estimator is just a really nice way to represent your survival data. Um, and so in the Kaplan-Meier curve, you're showing the probability that a member from a gr given group will have a lifetime exceeding T, um, as we saw. And so it really just displays your data back to you. Um, and so if you have the number of people at risk of dying at time t, 
and you have the number of actual deaths, um, it's just calculating the proportion of people that have died of your full group. Um, so here we already talked about this guy. Um, what's nice here, you can see also uh, that half the people are expected to have died at about, I can't quite see, is it? It looks like uh, before half a year. Um, so pretty dire if you're in group two, um, but half the people are expected to have died within about two years if you're in group uh, one, which is um, good compared to group two, but still not great. Um, and then you have a hazard ratio. So that's comparing the two groups. And so hazard ratios are really important um, when you're actually modeling uh, your survival data because that's showing what's the difference between your groups. And they're represented as a relative risk. So it's the risk if you're in group one versus the risk if you're in group two. Um, and so if you have a hazard ratio of 0.3, or sorry, 0.43, you can think of it as, um, oh, I've lost my cursor. Um, so the condition of group one is 43% of that of group two. So it's saying 0.43 over one is how you could interpret that. So you could say uh, group one is has a much worse uh, outcome than group two, or less than half the survival of group two. And then um, a hazard ratio of two would say you have double uh, the, the right of failure. Oh, no. Sorry, I'm interpreting these the opposite way. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, so 0.43 would be good in this case because it's saying a poor outcome, so a hazard, is lower in group one, right? And then if it's two, it's saying it's dramatically higher. So if you have two, it's saying the hazards are twice as high in group one than they are in two. Apologies. All right, and so Cox proportional hazards, and this is what we're going to use to actually model our, our data. An, another modeling technique is um, using accelerated failure time models that I brought up before, um, and those uh, they're, they require more parameterization of your data, but even uh, apparently even Cox himself preferred uh, accelerated failure time models, so I would consider them uh, if you're doing an analysis. Uh, I would consider either, especially if, and we'll, we'll look at this in our uh, data, especially if your data doesn't meet the proportional hazard assumption. Um, so if you don't meet the assumptions of the Cox proportional hazard model or you're trying to not model hazards, but you want to model specific time points, so you want to estimate at what point is everyone going to die, accelerated failure time models can be very useful for that. Um, but Cox models are extremely popular, uh, so we're going to go over them, and, and they're very, they very useful. They're popular for a reason. Um, so they capture how well um, multiple variables, um, such as genes, clinical variables, uh, or clusters that you identify, affect survival. Um, and so you estimate the ratio of risks here, and the way you do it is a Cox regression, where you have a baseline hazard, and you're multiplying... Uh, by the exponentiated um, uh, prognostic index here, and that's where your linear model lies. Um, and so it's kind of a generalized linear model, in effect, that you're fitting here. Um, and so some intuition, so um, you have a log hazard ratio. Um, so for one unit increase in your predictor, it's the log increase in um, hazards, so an increase in, in what's your likelihood of having a, an event. Um, and so the exponent of that is the hazard ratio increase for one unit increase. Um, and if your beta value is less than zero, then there's a decreased hazard, so longer survival. So if you have uh, beta values, if you're coming up with beta values that are less than zero, then you're identifying protective features in your data. If they're greater than zero, then uh, they're deleterious features. And if you exponentiate them, then you can actually get the hazard ratio. And so in a lot of the models, they'll give you both the, the raw um, uh, coefficient, and then they'll also give you the exponentiated coefficient, so you can interpret both. And they're multiplicative, right? So it's the proportion increase, uh, just as we showed before. Like, two is double uh, their survival time, or double the likelihood of a hazard, and uh, 0.5 would be uh, half the likelihood of a hazard.
Um, and so if you look at the hazard ratio for a subject with a set of predictors compared to a subject with another set of predictors, you would look at the ratio um, of their hazards. Um, and then that could be calculated by seeing uh, the beta values times uh, their characteristics for one person minus the characteristics for the other person. So it's the difference in their hazards there, um, which is a really mathematically very convenient uh, way to think about it. Um, and so they can be interpreted as a percentage change in risk. Um, so here, this example, I always found this confusing, but I, I think uh, it makes sense. So if you have one when treatment's active and zero when treatment's a placebo, if the hazard ratio, so um, not the beta coefficient, but the exponent of the beta is 0.8, it means you have a 20% decrease in mortality risk using the treatment. So the treatment is protective. Um, and it shows 80% uh, share of the full uh, hazard. Okay. All right, and then the concordance index. So one challenge with um, hazard or with survival models is expressing um, what's fitting your data the best. And so one way people have done this is how well does one survival model uh, order your data versus another one? So uh, is everyone in the correct order uh, based on your model? And the reason this is attractive for Cox models is because estimating the baseline hazard, uh, it can be tricky. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, and so you don't want to be predicting the actual time uh, to event. That can be very sensitive. So you're instead predicting, am I getting the relative timing right? So am I saying this group of patients uh, is going to have an event before this other group of patients. So are you ordering them correctly? And that's what the concordance index actually indicates. So it captures your ability to order your individuals correctly with respect to their survival time. Um, and so this is the formula for it. Um, so you have how you count how many pairs are concordant. Um, and then how many pairs are ties? So if you have them estimated at the same time, um, but they aren't, uh, you'll, you'll do 0.5 times that. And then you divide it by all pairs. So it's just looking at the proportion of pairs that you're ordering correctly out of all the possible pairs. Um, and so no other metric captures the ordering of the individuals, but it's really important to specify when you're using the C index. I've seen a lot of people use this as a proxy for AUC, for example, or different things, and it's really not that. <laughs> so um, it's, it's quite different, and its, uh, it's interpretation is very different um, from, for example, an AUC. 